synthesize the notes and ideas that came up today uh, so that we don't lose them and we've got them as seed corn uh, for tomorrow's discussion. So now um, it is with great pleasure that I turn my attention to Matthew Jackson. Uh, he is our second keynote speaker uh, talking models of social learning and forces for non-consensus. He is the William D. Eberly Professor of Economics at Stanford and an external member of the faculty at, at the Santa Fe Institute. He has more awards and accolades than I could possibly go through without taking up all of the time he's got for the keynote. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Matthew Jackson. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Matt. And uh, thanks to you, know, you Bill, Josh, um, Erez, uh, Yvonne, for, for putting this all together. It's really been illuminating for me. Let me share my screen and then start the slideshow. OK, great. So I'm going to hop right in. And uh, you know, th there'll be a narrow focus and then a wider focus. The narrower focus is going to be on social learning and you know, answering questions of why people have beliefs that differ on fundamental factual questions, safety of vaccines, global warming, um, to human activity, capital punishment. And that these actually can persist and grow even after exposure to common information. So you give people the same information and, and they actually become more polarized. And I think, you know, why do we care about these kinds of issues? We care about them for at least two reasons. One is that they lead to polarization, which can have an implication of poorly functioning gov governments, lower growth, it hurts economies, it hurts welfare. Um, and also, it, it, and I'll talk about this at, at some point, um, inequality and immobility are also byproducts of this. So there's barriers to investments, um, fairness concerns, lost productivity. So there's a whole series of reasons that we care about this. And I think there's a lot of implications for what I want to talk about for this sort of inverse generative um, method. And I'm going to start by just saying that, and, and this echoes something that Josh said um, yesterday, you know, that we're, we're sort of interested in knowing the why and not just the how. And it's sort of, a, you know, a funny, it, when I was a student, a PhD student, there were two computer systems at, at Stanford. One was called why, and that was for the PhD students. And the other one was called how, and that was for the MBA students. And, and I always thought, I always wondered why the, the MBAs weren't insulted by thinking that they were just working on the how and not the why. Um, we got to work on the fun stuff, but I, I think it's, it's important in terms of, of thinking back through these models because understanding exactly what's the right model to generate observed behavior is important because that's the, the, the foundation for any policy analysis that we wanna do or any predictions that we wanna do out of sample. So if we're trying to figure out how is the world gonna change or how, how should we be designing policies or what are the implications of policies, we need to know that we have the right model and we have um, hit the essential features. So that's point one. Point two is that um, often, and I think this is, is something we overlook as social scientists all the time, uh, there's many different forces that impact any particular situation. And so it, it, it might not be that there's just one particular model that's right. It might be some kind of combination of many different forces that are working at the same time. And that's very important for understanding. And I'll, I'll say more on that for, for a minute. The third is, that it's then important to sort of figure out what's the scope of the problem and what's the right setting to, to explore in, in building a model and trying to understand what's happening. Where do we cut at the edges? And this gets back to some things that Scott Page talked about yesterday in terms of Coleman's boat and so forth. We want to understand these kinds of feedback effects that occur. And so having the right scope is important. If we, if we get too narrow, then we miss important aspects of the modeling that, that'll work out in, in ways that we might not expect otherwise. Um, and then I'm gonna say some more about this at the end, and I'll call these model cocktails and policy cocktails. And because I think that, that it's important to understand that these things are not just one particular um, force at work at a time, but there can be interacting forces and these interacting forces mean that you have to both understand them, understand their synergies, their complementarities, 
and then use that in designing policy. And, and so with that sort of preview, um, I'm gonna be talking about four, I'm gonna focus on four forces today uh, that, that sort of lead people to have different beliefs. And one is that agents, the agents themselves that we're modeling have models that are limited. They, they model the world, they have views of the world and those have limitations to them and they don't necessarily coincide. So their own experiences and histories can lead them to have different models of the world and have and as a result, different behaviors. Um, the second is that, that humans tend to have systematic bias in interpreting information and that's also based on their histories. And I'm gonna talk about that and give you some experimental evidence for that. And then I'm gonna transition and talk a little bit about how network structure works because people are not making these decisions and, and getting information in isolation they're actually getting it through the network. And so who they know affects what information they have. And, and it also, you know, the, the structure of, the, of that, those interactions affects the noise that are present in the system. And I think part of the explanation for what's happening more recently in terms of increased polarization is due to increased noise and increased reach in these networks. Okay, so I'm gonna start by just going through so a, a very simple intuition that comes out of a, a recent paper it was just published this year by with Nika um, Hagtotab and Ariel Pakasha. And, and here we're gonna model agents as modelers. And instead of being Bayesians and refining a prior, agents are gonna build a model based on their past experiences. They forecast from the model and then when it stops working, they replace it. And so the kind of setting you can think of is that people are observing um, some set of past experiences. So they have a um, world where they have some situation X, you know, the variables that describe kind of situations and so forth. And they're trying to make predictions about things on um, Y variables. And so beliefs would be a model of the world. So they have some belief of, of a function which takes X's into Y's. And there's some distribution, true world distribution is generating these things and they're modeling it. And, um, you know, for simplicity, you can think of the X space as being some Euclidean space, some, some multi-dimensional Euclidean space and say y is being minus one or one, say, you know, that the world, uh, the um, man is causing global warming or not, or the vaccine's safe or it's not, et, et cetera, okay? And what, you know, a simple example of this, and, and I think you'll get most of the intuition from, from just, a, you know, a simple picture. Um, this would be one example of data that might be out, you know, so there's a couple of dimensions of, of different situations, and each point here is then labeled with either a minus one or a one. And so say, take the red ones to be um, minus ones, the, the uh, or sorry, plus ones and the blues to be minus ones, for instance. Um, this would be a system where it would be pretty easy to classify, right? So the idea here is you can classify the points here based on some function and, and the real world looks like this and people are trying to learn what this function looks like. So they're seeing data over time and they're trying to learn it. And let's think of agents as having some complexity cost. So they're gonna have a complexity cost that's a, uh, that depends on their function. And then they make errors if their function isn't right. So if their function makes a bad prediction, they're making an error. And you can think of the overall cost as what's the um, a cost of how many errors are they gonna make under the true world, plus what's the cost of complexity that they're facing. So for instance, um, you could have a simple linear classifier where you're just linearly classifying things. And I'll, I'll show you one in, in a minute and then have the cost increasing in dimension. So for instance, this would be um, a very simple linear classifier that would um, split the, the, the plus ones from the minus ones. So if I had this model of the world and I say, look, um, I'm gonna hit everything with a, a vector of, of plus one minus, or sorry, one, one. And then if it comes out positive, um, I'll give it a one. And if it comes out negative, I'll give it a minus one. That model would perfectly fit this world. So this is a world that would be easy to fit with a linear classifier, okay? But let's suppose now that people have costs of complexity. And in particular, they have costs of the, the dimensions of their model. So this is a simple kind of machine learning setting where now if, if I have some cost of this complexity, um, if I can, for instance, if one dimension is all I can handle in my model, then I, I could either have a vector that is, is vertical you know, or horizontal effectively, and I can classify things this way. So I could use one dimension, but if I classify things this way, I'm gonna make errors, right? So I've got errors and I'm gonna, I'm gonna misclassify some of the ones, I'm gonna misclassify some of the minus ones. And 
I could use a different classifier that would also you know, have just one dimension to it and I would make different errors, okay? And so what's the, the point here is gonna be that different people might've had different experiences. So imagine this is the world and each person is a model. So they're, they're generating their own model from their past experiences that best fit their data. Um, depending in, in this particular situation, there's two that are equally good at, at, at fitting these data, right? So for these data, if I have a one dimensional model, I could use either dimension and it would fit the, the, the things equally well. So some random differences in the data that people observe would lead them to different models. And so for here, you know, what we, we showed is take, you know, take for instance, a linear F where the cost is a function of the dimensions. Um, it's very easy to generate lots of sort of effectively symmetric kinds of, of distributions for which two IID samples are going to lead to functions, um, minimizing functions that end up having substantial differences in their predictions. So the agents are gonna end up with models where slight differences in their experiences lead them to very different models. And although they're gonna perform equally well, they're gonna make different predictions in different settings, okay? So very, very similar data um, could end up giving them different models of the world and end up giving them different predictions uh, in, as a function of what they've observed. Okay, so you know the intuitions here are that the constraints on the complexity are limiting people's models, and there's some asymmetry. You know, the, if there's actually some symmetries in the world, and then some asymmetries in their experiences, that's going to lead them to focus in on different dimensions of the world and um, have different beliefs. And so let me just show you some data that's uh, actually um, quite consistent with this. So there's a, a nice paper by Mole, Nathan, and Spies in Journal of Economic Perspectives, 2017. And they have a, what they do is they, they actually show um, trying to build models um, to predict housing prices based on the American Housing Survey. So they've got all this data on housing prices. They've got huge numbers of variables and they're trying to figure out which variables to use. And what they do is they use lasso predictions or lasso regression. So lasso, is, if you don't know, it is a technique for, for penalizing yourself for using more dimensions. And so you, you try and minimize the number of dimensions you're using. You're trying to pick out some the right, what are the best set of variables to predict outcomes? How would I do that? And so they, they split this um, thing into 10 partitions of 5,000 units and then ran the um, lasso on each different uh, unit. So they, they could see how would, if I'd gotten these data, which model would I use? If I use this other data, what, what model would I use? And here's the picture of what they got. So um, on the vertical axis, you have the, the parameter in these linear models. And then on the x-axis, you have this sort of 10 different bins of the data. And what you can see is that you have incredibly different models. So each one is giving you a very, very different model. And each one of these models will end up performing roughly equally well in terms of predicting prices, but they'll be using different variables. And if you gave them two different houses, they might make very different predictions for what the value of that house was. But on average, they're doing equally well, right? So each one of them is penalizing, say, we're, we're trying to keep your model simple. They'll uh, come up with different simple models. They'll make similar average numbers of predictions correct uh, in, in terms of you know, various different dimensions of uh, metrics for performance, but they'll, they'll make very different predictions um, themselves. And so in terms of, you know, sort of the why implications of this, this is, this sort of suggests that different optimal models can lead to similar, you know, predictive cost-based performances, but disagree substantially. And slight experience differences can lead to different um, cost-constrained models. And I think, you know, if we start thinking about policies, if we think about people like this, we can understand, okay, why is it that people might have fundamentally different views on climate change? Well, let's suppose that some people's view of the world is a scientific view. So most of their experience has to do with science and they take science seriously. And other people's um, experiences come more from a political perspective. And so their models built on politics. You can imagine that one person believes, okay, I follow the science. The other person believes, okay, this is all a political game to try and get funding for something. And they're looking at the same data and coming to very different perspectives in terms of what the implications are and whether they support this or believe in it and so forth. And that um, you know, is quite natural, but understanding that means that if you wanna overcome these gaps, 
you've got to get people concentrating on the same variables or somehow building similar models. So you want your agents to start to converge. Okay. So that, that's one force. So this is just saying, okay, it, it's, you know, if we want to understand people's differences in beliefs, we can understand that there's a lot of models that are going to be similar in terms of pre predicting the world and heterogeneous agents could come up with heterogeneous models. And that's a, a, just a, a very basic um, point to try and understand why we can get polarization. Okay. Um, next, next point up, I, I want to talk about, okay, that, that's a, a cost constraint on people's ability to process information. There's also some psychological constraints that just end up in systematic biases in the ways that people up, update information. And I want to show you just a simple example of this and then take you through some experiments that I think are um, fairly convincing of, of how people are actually doing this. So let's imagine that there's two states, A and B, and, and you're trying to understand whether the world is state A or B. So is, you know, is this vaccine safe, not safe? Um, is, is, uh, do we have problems with man-induced global warming, et cetera? So we can get signals that are correlated with A and B. So you can have little signals people are getting over time. Um, studies are coming out. They interpret the studies. Um, they're hearing from their friends and so forth. So they're getting signals A's, B's, and AB's. And the key thing in this is that it's, it's not true that every piece of information is unambiguously for one state or another. There's going to be some um, ambiguous signals. And the ambiguous signals come in the form of AB's in this particular example. So let's think that there's some probability Q that regardless of the state, so if the true state's A, you're going to get more likely to get A's than B's but you're still gonna get some fraction of ambiguous information that comes out. So some studies are gonna be inconclusive. Um, some people might not know exactly what to tell you. So you're gonna get A, Bs occasionally. And so what happens here is you're getting these sequence of A's. If, you know, if the state is true state is A, you're gonna get more likely to get A. This true state is B, more likely to get B. And sometimes you get these ambiguous signals. So for instance, let's imagine that the state was really A and about half the time you get ambiguous signals. And the probability that the signal, if it's not ambiguous, matches the state is two thirds. So you should get about two thirds A's, one third B's, but you're also going to get some ambiguous signals. So you get a sequence along, and, and the sequence pops out A, then there's another study that comes out AB, two inconclusive studies, then a, a study that shows B, then a study that shows A. Now I'm the, the interpreter. So I'm the receiver, I'm learning, I'm an agent who's learning from this sequence of, of information. What am I going to do with this? Okay, well, if I was a Bayesian, what would I do with this? So if I was fully rational and understood that ABs are, are basically just noise, I would ignore them, right? So uh, if I'm a pure Bayesian, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna drop out all those ABs, ignore them, and then I'm gonna see that the signal, the sequence of signals is more likely to have A's than B's in it. And so from that, I'm gonna conclude that the state is more likely to be A than B. So if I was Bayesian, I would do that. But let's instead suppose that I'm an interpreter. I'm a person who tends to interpret signals. And if I see an ambiguous signal and I believe that the world is more likely to be A, I'm going to shift that towards an A. So ambiguous stuff, I'm going to, I'm going to tilt the interpretation towards my prior. And so what happens is when I see an AB, I interpret it as an A. I think this is more likely to be coming from an A state than a, than a B state. And so what happens then is I'm going to start interpreting these and now I'm going to see a sequence that looks like A, 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 then B, then A. So I'm interpreting all these ambiguous ones as being in my favor. And what happens now is I see a, a heavily loaded A sequence. I become even more convinced of A. I mean, I'm seeing these at a very high rate. But an interpreter with a prior on B would instead take all these ambiguous things and interpret them as B. So if I'm a person who's had you know, a, a bunch of experiences that are somewhat negative in, in some particular contexts. Um, when I get into a, a context where maybe that's not what's going on, so maybe I, uh, I believe that, that certain um, people are going to be racist, I have uh, encounters with them, I might interpret those encounters in ways that would be different than somebody who had different prior experience or, or, or previous experiences. That's going to tilt the way that people view the world. And you can end up with two people seeing the same situations having different interpretations of them and then have it coming out with different um, conclusions as a function of that. So an interpreter of the prior MB would end up seeing this, 
perturbative variety of A, and they're going to become increasingly um, polarized. One's going to be leaving the world to more B, the other more A. So it, what we did is we did some experiments on this. So we gave, what we did is we, we tested people's beliefs on climate change and the death penalty. So we asked people, um, participants came in, we had a, um, a, a several hundred people that we, we worked with, like six or 700. They came in, we gave them questions. Um, do you think human activity is a cause of rising temperatures? That was a climate change question. Do you think the death penalty deters people from committing murder? Um, that was the death penalty question. And then what we did is we, we actually had a bunch of studies, scientific studies that we took from different journals. And we broke those into three categories. Ones that were unambiguously um, supporting the claim, ones that were uh, unambiguously against the claim, and then a bunch of studies that were kind of mixed or um, ambiguous, had you know, um, inconclusive findings or uh, ambivalent findings, findings in both directions. And then we summarized those in paragraphs. And then we showed them to these people and then we asked them to what they thought of these studies, and then we reassessed their beliefs at the end. So they read six summaries, two that were pro, uh, uh, you know, that, that human cap, uh, activities, the cause of rising temperatures, two that were against this that showed that human activity is not causing rising temperatures. Those were a little harder to find, in fact. Um, and then uh, a bunch of ambiguous ones that were unclear, where there was some mixed findings and so forth. And then um, similarly on the death penalty. And then what we did is we assessed people, you know, before and after. So we went in, um, people could, could, you know, say, does this summary um, shows that the death penalty does not deter people or the death penalty does deter people. So they had a, a, a 17 point scale that they could click on and they could click after each study um, what they thought of, of whether the study was, uh, was unclear, clear, uh, evidence for or against and so forth. And then what you find here is um, pretty clear evidence that people's prior belief um, impacts the way that they interpreted this, the studies. So when you look at, so these studies on average had a zero, um, uh, you know, overall the participants was on, were on average zeros. Um, the prior belief, if, if this is the direction of your, so if you have an, a negative prior belief, you were more likely to interpret this negatively. If you had a positive prior belief, you were more uh, um, likely to view it positively. And similarly for the death penalty. And you know, pro, pros, cons, uh, unclear ones, they were all going in the direction that people had their, their priors. And then what we did was also look at the belief updating. So the overall interpretations were on average zero. And we could look at what's the fraction of people who after seeing two studies for, two studies against, and two that were ambivalent um, was essentially uh, you know, null information on average. Um, what's the fraction with the post bigger than the average so that became more extreme? So look at their, their post belief compared to the average and look at their prior compared to the average. And uh, the fraction that became more extreme was actually 33% on, on climate, 33% on death, and 55% on at least one of the two. Okay, so what does this all mean? This is a, another, a, a, a very different effect than the first one. So the first one is people are, are modeling the world. This is that they're interpreting information that they're gonna put into whatever model they have. And that processing of information depends on prior experiences. They're, they seem to be interpreting this stuff based on their prior. And so understanding this suggests that if you wanna make sure that people are correctly interpreting information, filters and flags on ambiguous information becomes important. So if you have something that's ambiguous, you want to flag it as ambiguous so people don't interpret it to be um, something that's not ambiguous. But emphasizing objective information um, becomes important so that they're not putting too much subjective interpretation on objective information. Okay. So that gets to two of these forces that are, are, are essentially psychological forces. And now I want to turn to um, a couple of uh, social forces and, and in terms of um, limiting people's access to information and, and causing some differences in, in both beliefs and outcomes. And I'll start with just a couple of pictures. Um, this is a picture from a study I did with uh, Paolo, uh, <clears throat> Sergio Curarini and Paolo Pin um, some years ago. And, and here what we have is just a high school of students 
They're color coded by race. And these are indicating strong friendships between the students, students that did at least three activities together in a week. It's drawn with a spring algorithm. So it, the algorithm is trying to find the groups. And effectively, these are, uh, you can see the, the blue dots are um, self-reported as being black. The yellow dots are whites, reds are Hispanics. And you see a, just a, a, a pretty clear cut in this um, network where the, uh, there's very few connections across the black and white students. Um, effectively, they're not interacting much at all. I think there's um, fewer than five relationships between the, the blacks and the whites in this network. Um, and, and this is not an atypical network. So there's 84 schools in this data set. Um, they all, even though they look balanced racially on paper, they can um, look very unbalanced when you look at the friendships. Why is this going to be important? This is going to be important because information is going to be shared within these networks and uh, parts of the network and not necessarily across. And that can shape different beliefs, different cultures, and different behaviors across these different groups. Um, similarly, here's a, a study with, with Abhijit Banerjee, Arun Chandrasekhar, and Esther Duflo. Um, this is an uh, Indian village, households sharing kerosene and rice. And now they're color coded by caste. So in this case, the gray squares are relatively advantaged castes um, and the reds are relatively disadvantaged. And again, you see a, a pretty strong split in this network. Um, people are 15 times more likely to be associating with people of the same um, caste designation than across. Um, this is a pretty rough cut. There's actually much many more cuts. There's 53 cuts in, in these villages on, on subcasts, but um, we can see that there's, they're pretty strongly split. Okay. So this is known as homophily in the sociology literature. Um, and this idea that people are associated with people that are similar to them is a double-edged sword. And what do I mean by that? Uh, when, when people are, are trying to learn from the world around them, there are two forces. Um, one is that seeing someone who's similar to yourself succeed is more informative than seeing somebody who's completely different than you um, it, it is succeeding. So for instance, if you're trying to encourage um, first generation students to apply to colleges and to, to get a college education, then showing them that other first generation students who have similar um, challenges in terms of financial and, and training, um, showing that they can succeed is much more informative to them than um, showing them that, that somebody who came from a, a relatively wealthy background with a lot of tutors and so forth succeeded in college, that's a completely different um, level of information that they're getting. So one is that they can learn more from people who are similar to themselves. But the second part is that you're only seeing people who are similar to yourself can limit the, the scope of the information that you see. And so there's a trade-off of higher quality information um, versus narrower and more correlated information. And, and so effectively, homophily can lead groups to herd on inefficient decisions because you're only learning about your own group's actions. And, and this is a very different reason for herding than the sort of standard herding in, in economics the, um, you know, that has come out both in economics and finance, where you're, you're following people because you infer that they're doing something because it must be the better action. Here, you're following people just because you don't have information outside of the actions that they're choosing. So you, you, you're just uninformed and don't have the ability to assess those. And so I'm gonna take you through just a, a simple illustration of this and we can talk about sort of how homophily affects this. And this will give us very different kinds of policy implications than the stuff we've seen before. So here, um, this is work with a student here, um, Eunice Kanabash. And uh, we, we just you know, think of two groups, blues and greens. And there's an action they can take um, say the safe action, which is just get a minimum wage job, or they can go to college, um, which is risky for them. And it, it, it has some unknown payoff that they're not sure how to assess unless they've seen other people go to college and then seen some of the outcomes. And let's think of um, there also being costs to taking this risky action. So for the blues, it's a relatively low cost, lower than the expected value of this, ex ante expected value. So they expect college to be uh, more valuable than the, their cost. For the greens, it's costly, you know, either financially or in terms of all the energy that they have to expend to manage to get into college. And it's more costly for them. And their cost is above this expected value. 
So the greens won't tend to do this unless they get information that it's good. Um, the blues tend to do it unless they get information that it's bad. Okay. And and here you've got you know it's sort of you know a, a mention of this sort of fits into Coleman's boat kind of setting um, uh, that, that Scott was talking about yesterday, where we have this feedback um, where one generation's decisions are going to affect the information that the next generation has, and then their decisions, and then that's going to feed back through the system. So we're going to have a dynamic that depends on each generation system and uh, decisions, and, and that'll um, propel this, this forward. And we're going to have two effective uh, things in this model. One is that I'm going to learn payoffs and actions from D people from the previous generation. So that's how big is my network? How many people am I going to see? So D, if, if I see 10 people, that gives me more of a chance than if I see five. And then homophily is that I'm going to, if I'm a green, um, what's the fraction of those 10 that I'm going to see that are also green? H is going to be the fraction. So if it's like 70%, then I'm seeing 70% of my um, interactions are going to be with, with previous greens and only 30% with blues. And so the homophily pattern will be impacting um, what's the overall uh, mix of information I get from previous blues and previous greens. And then think of, of observing this previous generation with some noise. And in particular, what's going to be true is I'm going to have higher quality information from my own type than from the other type. So if I observe um, the same type, then I have some probability of getting uh, good information from them. And we'll just model this in a very simple way that there's some probability pi s that I observe the outcome if, if one of my friends is um, the same, and there's a different probability of observing what their outcome was, so of seeing their V uh, if, the, if, the, um, if they're a different type, okay? And the homophily benefit is that I, it's easier for me to communicate and assess the outcomes for the same types than the different types. So this pi S is bigger than the pi D, okay? So I, I have a higher chance of, of, of learning from my own type than the other type, but I'm gonna learn different things from different types. So for instance, if I'm a green and um, all the greens are, are working in, in minimum wage jobs and none of them went to college and I happen to see them, then um, I'm not gonna learn what the value to going to college is. I'm just gonna go um, and, and you know, take the safe action and take the minimum wage job. If I happen to get lucky and observe somebody who is getting the higher education, uh, if I have a friend who, ha you know, if green happens to have a friend that's blue and learns about what the value of the college education is, then they go ahead and invest in the college education here. They see the high value um, and they see that it exceeds even their cost. They go ahead and, and do this, okay? So that's a simple possible model. And now you can just track this model by what's the fraction of greens taking the action? What's the fraction of blues taking the risky action over time? And then you've got um, a system where you know, uh, what's the probability that I'm going to hear um, the, uh, the value of action, uh, the risky action from the previous generation, if I'm a green, if I'm a blue, and so forth, and you can follow this um, forward, okay? So let's think of the dynamics when the blues are low cost and the greens are high cost, and they've got some homophily number. We'll make it less than one, so there's some interaction across across types. So there's some chance that a green sees a blue. Otherwise, it's just a you know a, a unilateral system. And here you can go through and you know you can solve what the steady state looks like, and it you, it solves out as a function of these pies in the homophily, and it's increasing in the information that you get, um, both the pi s and the pi d. Um, the interesting thing is that the homophily affects it differently depending on what the current state of the model is, okay? And this is the Coleman's vote and the kind of feedback effect that Scott was talking about yesterday. The, the more people, the more greens that are out there who are actually invested. So once there's a lot of greens in college, then it's valuable to have homophily because I'm gonna learn from them with high probability. But if there are almost no greens in college, then it's better not to have much homophily because I'm not gonna learn much from the greens. I'm better off learning from blues. So if I'm a green, I'm going to learn more about college um, depending on how many greens are in college. If there's a lot of greens in college, then it's good to learn from them. If there's not many, then it's better to be learning from the blues. And so what you get is when you look at sort of the overall connectedness of people in the network, 
and how many greens end up going to college, you can model that out as a function of the homophily. So, you know, with the homophily, if there was no homophily, sort of an even split in the world, I, I was listing greens and blues equally, then the more people I hear from, the higher the chance I'm going to learn that college is good, the higher chance I go to college. Um, but what, what's interesting is then as you increase the homophily, that hurts you for low levels, low connectedness levels, because now I'm not learning as much from the blues that are the valuable ones. But once it gets above a certain level, now the greens are going to be going to college and then learning from them is even more valuable. So once you hit this threshold, it becomes more valuable. And it turns out that all of these intersect at the same threshold. So there's a, a key threshold here, which is the point at which I expect to learn the same amount from same and different where all these homophilies kind of cross and, and you get interesting policy implications as a result of this. So, um, you know, in terms of bringing this back to the whys in this model, um, if you want to improve the situation here, you need to help provide more information. And you can think of sort of trying to supplement or, or nudge these networks in different ways, either giving them information, giving them additional connections, um, changing their homophily level. So you could try and increase the, the connections by mentorships. You could try and um, increase the number of role models by giving people uh, scholarships and putting them in these situations. Um, but if in terms of the homophily, low homophily is good initially, but then higher homophily is, is better eventually. So you, you end up with different kinds of policy prescriptions depending on the state of the system and how it changes. Okay, um, let me just uh, mention one other kind of important aspect that I think is often overlooked in learning models, especially in trying to figure out how people are learning from each other, how agents are developing their beliefs and so forth. And that's noise and mutations. And uh, I'm going to start by just giving you some examples from the literature that sort of motivates this and, and why, why it's interesting to talk about. And the first is um, from a study by uh, Leibn, Noll, and Kleinberg. It's an old study now, 2008. But what they did is they traced out um, chain letters in, in email. And this is a picture from one of those. And um, each one of these, so I blew it up here at the bottom, each one of these nodes is a person. And then um, the, the next node is the person that they forwarded this email to. And this was um, a chain letter protesting the start of the war in Iraq. And this chain letter went through and people could send it to their friends and then they could send it to their friends and so forth. And then at the end, Leib and Noel were able to trace back through the, the email servers, chase, trace back these chains. Okay, so what's remarkable about this? What's remarkable about this is how long and deep this tree is and how narrow it is, right? So it's a fairly narrow tree and it's incredibly long. It's a very um, peculiar tree in terms of what you might expect from say a, a Galton-Watson process or some other kind of random generating process that generates trees outwards. It's, it's very close to a critical um, degree of one and it's incredibly long. And so the, the median depth, node depth here is 288. So if you were one of these people who got this email in the, in the, the chain, um, typically you would have gotten it after it had been passed along 288 times. And what's sort of remarkable about that is that sort of flies in the face of what we think of as the small worlds hypothesis that you know, um, Watson Strogatz made popular, which is the idea that you know, we're sort of six degrees of separation uh, away from somebody um, or you know, if you, if you look at Facebook, 4.7 degrees of separation. So you, you know, effectively you can reach all the way around the world in a, sh a short number of hops, yet this information is not taking shortest paths, it's taking very, very long paths. And okay, so, so that's one fact, which I think is important to understand and how people are getting information. It could be passed along quite a, a long ways. And then the second part, I'll just show you, um, something that comes out of a study that, that Lada Damek and, and uh, folks at Facebook have been doing. So there's several papers in this series, um, but they look at mutations of information along this. And so this is one from a Twitter study that they did. Um, <clears throat> and it starts out street style shooting in Oxford Circus for ASOS and Diet Coke. I saw, um, let, let, let me know if you're around. Okay, so what is that about? It's about there's an advertisement that's being filmed in, in part of London um, you know, you can come to this thing. Okay. 
What did what happened? Within three minutes, this became shooting in progress in the Oxford Circus. What and then shooting in progress in Oxford Circus stay safe people. So people misinterpreted the first um, piece of information and it became a completely different message and then was transmitted as this other message and then became viral quite quickly. And what they did, they, they looked at uh, hundreds of messages and also memes on Facebook and how they mutated. And they found that there was a fairly high mutation rate and um, hundreds of thousands of variations on the messages by the time that they were reaching um, their end state. Okay. So you can also begin to model this, right? So now we're learning, we're trying to learn between zeros and ones or minus ones and ones, et cetera. But we're in a world where there's this kind of noise. So think of a state being zero or one. You've got some prior probability that the state's one. Um, there's a bunch of people out there that are getting information. Maybe they're, they're doing studies. That gets to me via word of mouth or via iterative tweets or, or posts on people's Facebook pages, et cetera. And each one of those times, it can morph, okay? And so think of this as, you know, there's some probability that a zero becomes a one or a one becomes a zero. So a simple Markov chain kind of model where there's IID probabilities of mutating, but these could be random. It could be that there's just mistakes in sending these along, but it also could be deliberate. It could be that people deliberately, um, you know, hear something that says, okay, this vaccine is safe. And instead they want people to, to believe it's not. So they say, I've heard it's, it's not safe. And so they pass along a one instead of a zero. And you could also have probabilities of dropping messages. And so, you know, to get these long trees that we observe in the um, Leibniz, Noll and, and Kleinberg kind of research, you need uh, pretty high probabilities of these things not being passed along. And so what happens is there's some source and then there's a receiver who's eventually learning these things. And what happens is a one, you know, could you know, let's say there's a probability uh, 0.2 of passing something along and 0.8 of dropping it. And then zeros change to ones with 3% probability and ones change to zeros with a 10% probability. You know, then you get a simple Markov chain where a one stays a one. So, you know, after one step, there's an 18% chance I still hear it as a one. 2% chance I hear it as a zero, 80% chance it just didn't reach me. Um, after two steps, you know, you've got a 30.032 uh, chance that it's still a one. Um, now it's about a four to one ratio. So originally this is a nine to one ratio of ones to zeros. After two steps, it becomes a four to one ratio, much, many more being dropped. By three steps, it's down to a three to one ratio. And so this ratio, the fidelity of the information is just degrading over time and there's lower, lower chances of it, of it hitting you. Okay. And so what you can do is you can begin to think about putting this into a context where now I'm a learner down here and I've got lots of different places that stuff could be uh, um, originating and there's a trade-off in this tree, right? What's the trade-off? The trade-off is as I get further away, I'm reaching more and more of these sources but the fidelity in that information is getting worse and worse by the time it reaches me. So I'm being overwhelmed with noisier and noisier information the wider and, and deeper this tree gets. Okay. And so you can begin to think about how would you start to control this so I don't get overwhelmed with noisy signals. So these number of noisy signals is gonna be explode exponentially as this goes outwards. And so if you begin to think about this, I either want to limit the depth of this tree, the, the number of times that these things can be passed along, or the width of this tree. So one way to cut the, the noise out would just be to chop things off, right? To say, okay, look, we're not going to, you know, I'm going to build a platform, but I'm not going to allow um, messages to be transmitted more than three times. And that's going to allow them not to, to sort of build up this, this noise. That's very hard to do because messages morph. It's not even easy to tell they're the same message. Um, but you could also limit the breadth. And actually um, both WhatsApp and Facebook have put uh, caps on the number of people that you can message at the same time to five now. And that's an attempt. So if you actually limit the breadth of this tree that also um, decreases the relative numbers at greater distances compared to close distances and increases the, the fidelity. And so you can just you know, do simple simulations on this of different tree depths of, of how deep these trees are and then what the breadth is, and the deeper the trees get, so the longer and longer they get, the bigger the trade-off is, so that if you want the probability that most signals remain correct to be high, then you've got to have a lower breadth tree 
So really high breadth trees with high depth um, are going to build up too much noise. And um, you know, having a really wide tree only helps if the tree is, is, is not very deep. And otherwise, you, you face a trade-off, and you'd rather have um, a narrower tree. So this, this cutoff of five for WhatsApp and so forth comes in a world where these tree depths are effectively infinite. And so here, you, you, know, you very quickly pick up that that's going to be the optimal depth, um, a breadth, sorry, in, in terms of the tree to, to maximize this, in this kind of trade-off. OK, so, so why implications? People learn locally, and there's noisier information from a distance. And this is sort of an interesting, uh, I think, aside, but if we want to understand one thing that's changed a lot with the past 30 years of, of um, technological innovations is that we are connected with more and more people at greater and greater distances. And so the breadth of our network and the depth of our networks are both increasing. And it's possible that that's increasing the amount of noise um, with these broader and deeper trees and increasing the, the noise to signal ratio and makes it harder to learn. Um, so limiting networks can help. And so if you can pare down these networks, you can actually increase the, the value of the information that people are getting. The, the difficulty with that is you also, um, you know, if we start limiting people to say, you can only learn from people that are in, you know, immediately close to you, then we run into the problem we just talked about in the last um, force, which is the homophily, right? So the if, if I'm only saying, look, you can only, talk to people who you're immediately friends with, then, then I, I'm only learning from people who are very similar to myself, and that limits the information. So you've got a trade-off in terms of that as well. OK, so we have these four forces we've talked about. And you know the first two, you, I, I would think of as sort of psychological limits on information processing. The second two, um, we're thinking of more as social limits uh, on, on the information quality. And they're coming more from the network structure, which is both limiting the, the variety of information that I get and how much noise it has. And when you put all these things together, you've got a bunch of different forces that push people towards having different beliefs in a society and you know, possibly different outcomes, so inequality as well. And you've got these heterogeneity and experiences and their models, interpretation of the same information based on different experiences, different access to information, um, different quality of information and uh, fidelity. I mean, that sort of pushes you towards trying to learn mostly from people that are close and, and having a harder time interpreting things that have traveled a long distance. Um, one, you know, th these are four forces. I, I cut it off at four. I could have gone on to, to many more, but I think one that's worth mentioning, and I think, you know, was sort of prompted a little bit by some of the discussion yesterday and, and also in, in some of the um, breakout today. Um, you know, the, the institutions and the cultures can also shape the way that people act and what they believe and how, hence their behaviors as well. And so, you know, that's a, a whole other um, set of forces. Okay, so why all this matters? Um, again, policies and engineering depends on these underlying forces. And many forces are leading to, to persistent differences in beliefs, um, but they're operating at the same time. And um, one thing that I want to make, I, I think, is, is really important, and, and a, I think an important way to think about this is in a lot of contexts where we want to use models, especially, say, agent-based models or any variety of models, to understand how policies are going to work and what implications might be to make the world better, um, they're in these kinds of weakest link settings. And what do I mean by weakest link? I mean that there might be four, five, six, um, many different limits or barriers to hitting the optimal um, setting. And if all of those are in operation and you fix one of them, it, it might not be enough to get anything to work, right? So if you fix one, it might not make a difference. So for instance, if we go through and we say, okay, well, we're gonna give people mentorships um, so that now they, they know what the value is to, to going to college, but if we don't give them uh, the available um, financial help to, to make that choice or the um, training that they've had through grade school and high school to actually be ready to take advantage of it, then they can't, they can't make use of it. And so understanding all these different barriers at the same time means that you need policies that address all of them and not just one of them. So a model that, that looks at one of these things at a time might suggest a policy that ends up being completely ineffective. 
And so we might need policies that are combining these things. And I think one advantage of agent-based modeling is it can handle more complex models than we can solve or analytically understand exactly um, what all the, how the, all these forces are interacting. We can see how those work and we can build models with multiple barriers to learning and we can understand some of these weakest link kinds of forces. Um, one last uh, point, um, you can actually, you know, begin, so this is work I've been doing uh, with, uh, it's a group of like 12 authors. Um, this is with Abhijit and Esther and Arun and a, a team of people in India, um, where we've actually been working on complex policies. So the, in the recent paper we have, we're trying to assess 75 different policies at the same time and try to figure out what's going on and which ones are working, which ones aren't. And it's a combination of machine learning and some statistical techniques that you try and prune and, and combine policies to find out which mix work. And interestingly, this was in trying to get people immunized. This was pre-COVID. So we were working on uh, MMR and other vaccines. Um, but it turns out that a, a cocktail of three policies worked where none of the three worked in isolation. So if we tried separate models and, and the policies were essentially a, a financial incentive, some reminders and information from a trusted source. And if you didn't have that combination, none of the three worked alone, but all three together were quite effective in increasing about you know, almost a 50% increase in the amount of vaccination. So it was quite substantial. And you, you can begin, you know, so we described statistical techniques for trying to find the optimal mix from, from different experiments, but you can use these same techniques to find the optimal model. You know, if you want to figure out which models are working, which ones aren't, you have to run horse races of these models and you need to techniques to sort of identify which are the best combinations of models and how do you assess those. And that's something we talk about extensively in that paper. So I think that's a, a good point to um, stop and take questions and open it up for a wider discussion. Thank you very much. That was fascinating. Um, yes, so please, uh, questions in the chat or raise your hand and uh, we'll make sure that uh, you get a chance to ask. Well, while people are figuring that out, I've, your last, the complex policy thing I thought was fascinating. And it reminds me of an anecdote a researcher was telling me. They'd used um, a GA to try to come up with uh, drug cocktails for dealing with cancer. And one of the most effective ones that their system came up with actually had a carcinogen in it. But that's because it would get the cancer to grow faster. So it uptake the anti-cancer agents more quickly and thoroughly and kill it off. Yeah. So you get these really interesting things that in combination work quite well, but in isolation may not. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, I think, you know, in, in general, understanding how these things are gonna work in combination is tricky because as you're pointing out, there can be unexpected effects and synergies that we have no idea that, that might be there. And, you know, somehow I think that was in, in thinking through the challenges of, of sort of this inverse generative approach. That's one of the challenges is, is figuring out how do we build models that have all the right features in them so we can pick up on these kinds of synergies and pick up on things that might not be, seem yep. obvious, but do uh, become important in practice. And, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Josh. Yeah, Matthew, that was fantastic. Was a wonderful talk, very, very, you know, very creative synthesis, elegant, tractable, well-presented, just terrific in every, in every regard. Thank I you. was surprised you resisted the temptation of putting them all together in a single model with all of those things working, which I suspect would be very, very fascinating and rich and produce all kinds of wild dynamics. So, you know, I hope you're emboldened to go ahead and do that. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Two, two comments, one, one kind of tiny. Uh, when you talk mutation, it was interesting that you're, it's you're talking about propositions and mutations in propositions. And what you're really looking at are the grammatical rearrangements of the word string that people are willing to entertain, right? I, and I'm not, I, I think that's actually a difficult set to produce. And B, there might be people who rearrange the proposition in ways that are really gibberish 
so that so that the, putting a distribution on that set, I think you've done it in a perfectly fine way. But I think you know, if you wanted to become productively confused about that, <laughs> one way to do it would be to say, "What really is that set?" And I'm really putting a distribution on rearrangements of words and. For, there may be people who believe word strings that I find to be absolute gibberish. I mean, you know, there's an omnipotent creator of the universe. I don't regard that to be a meaningful claim, in fact. But there, so not to be obstreperous on some other topic, uh, Patrick is smiling because he's a co-conspirator on that. But in any event, that's one issue is this, this, this interpretation of mutation strikes me as very, very deep and and appealing. The other one, again, as you say, there are many other sources and heterogeneities. And I was thinking you've undoubtedly thought about this, but another, when you think about take the job at McDonald's or go to college is the whole issue of time and discounting. And that might be another source, another, another area of homophily might be discount rates themselves. I mean, some groups discount highly, some groups don't. And there's all sorts of razzmatazz you can do with that exponentially discounting and hyperbolic discounting. But just as another dimension of heterogeneity, uh, I thought, you know, undoubtedly you've thought about adding time too. So those are just off the wall responses to a fabulous talk. And, uh, you know, happy for any, any thoughts and response. Yeah, yeah, no, those are great points. And I, I think, you know, trying to understand how people interpret the world and how these things mutate, um, as you're pointing out, the things that sound like gibberish to one person can make perfect sense to another. And, and I think it's, um, you know, we, we sort of uh, abstracted away from a lot of interesting issues. And I think that gets back to the whole cultural issue of, and, and part of this ambiguous interpretation and the other model um, with Roland and Philip that, you know, their, uh, how people see the world is shaped by their own past experiences and how they interpret messages and, and so forth is, is a fairly rich um, function of what their past experiences are. And so, and, and, and that also means that they have more difficulty com communicating to people who don't have those same experiences, right? When we package things and talk to people, we often assume that they are on the same page in terms of language and understanding of certain things. And that can lead to a lot of confusion. And so I think that you know modeling all those different forces in communication, deliberate misinformation and disinformation compared to you know just differences in interpretation and differences in the way that we express ourselves, um, it's a pretty rich set of, of issues to try and, and govern. But it, I think it's it's sort of fundamentally at, at some of the aspects of why we have such disconnect in some of the discussions that go on politically these days. Um, people are coming from, from such different perspectives and not understanding that makes it really hard to, for them to communicate or even debate. Um, yeah, the other, the other not, to, not to take too much time, but I thought the other, the other thing that you might be interested in is what happens when there's a shock? You're getting signals from, you're getting big A and little B, or what happens if there's a shock to the environment? And we've been doing some work, Erez, Hatna and I and others have been doing some work on how shocks tend to people go with their predisposition after a shock, you know, and, and, and again, you know, not to, not to make too fine a point on it, but, you know, if there's a, if there's an earthquake in Christchurch, uh, New Zealand, uh, you know, Voltaire wrote a lot about sort of the religious people makes them more religious, the religious people makes them less religious. <laughs> and how do shocks to the system yeah. affect these polarizations and their rates and their distributions? Just another yeah. Another complicating factor you probably wise to ignore. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah, and I think you know, in, in the AB kind of world that we looked at, um, it's really hard to get people away from from where they polarize to yeah. because they they just keep interpreting the world and their in their their um, from through their lens, and, and that that becomes very distorted. And so even when the world changes fundamentally and there's a lot more bees coming along, it's really hard for an A person to start in um, really understanding that. Yeah. Um, the more ambiguous information's in there. So you need, you need somehow to filter out the, anything that's ambiguous and just make it really clear. It's, it's hard, yes. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Sad, but interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think we've got time for one more question. Oh, Patrick. Oh, you're, you're muted, Patrick. Muted. 
You're, yep, you're on mute. This is more a comment than a question, but it is a contrast between disciplines where the classical psychological literature on polarization characterizes it as irrational. And yet all of your models and much of the recent philosophical work is on ways in which given certain patterns of past experience, polarization is to be expected by entirely rational agents on both sides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the, the the models we use are basically, you can think of them as pretty simple information processing systems. So just view humans as very simple computers and they're just faced with some kind of problems. And then, you know, it's de it depends on how you program them and, and what information they're getting in. And, and all of these models could be put in that, in that paradigm. So it's a, it's a, a fairly simple perspective that way. And, and as opposed, it, you know, I think part of it is trying to explain why we would see behaviors that look like confirmation bias, right? So the AB thing looks like a psychological confirmation bias, but it comes out of just a, a simple computer that tip, you know, interprets AB signals as an A, right? And so, Very nice. yeah. All right, let's see, uh, Leo, how about last question? Hi, uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, I was wondering, so for some of the experimental work that you, uh, you mentioned where you actually showed people uh, real studies on like climate change or um, I think death penalty was the other one, yeah. whether the, um, so was it, did you find that the, how these prior affected just how they interpreted the ambiguous evidence or did that actually also affect their interpretation of the evidence that at least that you had marked as non-ambiguous? So for example, if somebody is a climate denier, um, did you find that that person was likely to say, oh, this paper, which had previously been marked as, you know, showing that climate change was man-made, uh, would actually interpret or affect their interpretation of this clear evidence, otherwise clear? Right, right. So, so even the, the, like the, the ones that we thought were very clear for or against on that 17-point scale ended up like in the five range. So it'd be like oh, a wow. plus five or a minus five. And they would take it to a plus seven or a minus seven. So the tendency was for people who believed one way to sort of pull the fives up to sevens and the people who were the other way would pull a five down to a three or a two. Mm -hmm. So even the ones that seemed, you know, we, we thought were clear one way or the other, they would, they would, you know, they would, there was a tension and a pull on both from both directions. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, that was fantastic. Um, it's too bad we can't uh, clap very well over Zoom. Um, now we've got, yeah, we can, we can all do it visually. Um, now we've got a quick break, uh, eight minutes. I'm sensing a trend here. We, we tend to like to chat. Um, and then we'll pick it up with a couple more uh, talks. Uh, yep, that is correct. Yep. <laughs>